Hello, everybody, and welcome to Anxious Meditating with Friends. Uh, I've had a bit of feedback, and I've been asked to keep the conversation to the beginning of the video, just in case somebody wants to meditate on their own with uh, guided meditation, and to speak a little bit louder. So I'm trying out both of those things. Um, the item for conversation today is how long until my mind completely stops wandering and is that even possible? Now, I've actually taken notes this time um, because this is uh, kind of a, a whole can of worms, um, the conversation about a person's mind wandering and where does it wander to? Um, we need to identify um, all the possible locations where we can place our attention. And as it turns out, um, depending on how you draw the lines, um, there are really only six places you can put your attention. The first five are the traditional sense doors. So eyes, ears, nose, mouth, um, and their sense objects. And the fifth being the body. And we, we usually think of the sense objects of the body being touch. Um, but if you've ever felt sick to your stomach or had a kidney stone, uh, that's not exactly touch because it's not really coming from the outside, but it's still a sense. Um, so the body is the fifth, and it's kind of a special one. And then the sixth sense door is your mind. So thoughts and emotions and anything else that comes up in the mind. Um, and that's it. The, those are the only possible locations for your attention. There is nothing else in existence with respect to what you experience um, through the sensorium, as it were. And... So knowing that we only have these six sense doors, we can talk about um, which sense door actually pertains to our object of meditation and which sense door is a distraction or which sense doors constitute a distraction. And so um, the object of our meditation is the breath. We say the breath. But how do you know that you're breathing? You know because you can feel it. So you can feel some cold air coming in. You can feel some hot air coming out. Um, you tend to feel it in this area, um, around the mouth, under the nose, near the nose, inside the nostrils. Um, and that's how we know that we're breathing. And so ultimately, in the space of the six sense doors, um, meditating on the breath really means meditating on the body in a small area, but it's, it's meditating on the body. And so then the question becomes, why the body? Why do we choose the breath and the body as a meditation object? It, it seems potentially kind of arbitrary initially, um, and it's not. Um, we meditate on the body only because that's the only way that we can feel the breath. There's no other way. And we meditate on the breath because it is described um, by a number of meditation teachers as this kind of link between the conscious mind and the unconscious mind. Our interest in observing the unconscious mind is... Uh, I'll get to that. <laughs> but the idea is is one of um, of exploring the unconscious mind intentionally. That that's actually a goal that we have. Um, the goal is not to escape thought. So we're not trying to get away from thought. We might feel like our thoughts are overwhelming us. Our emotions are overwhelming us and that we would actually like to go somewhere else. Um, that's not the point. So we're not trying to escape thought. 
um, we're trying to uh, draw our attention to a particular location. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. The, the idea that we can escape thought is, um, is actually kind of, uh, it's a mistaken understanding. Um, we don't really have any control over our thoughts. So we understand this from a neuroscience perspective now that, and it makes sense intuitively and intellectually that a thought is actually emergent, right? Um, a thought begins somewhere. Um, there is no you to start it somewhere deep inside your aggregate, your a bunch of meat and um, neurological impulses and whatever else is going on inside your body. So in and amongst those impulses, a thought begins. And we only really recognize it as a thought once it reaches the surface. So once that thought is gross enough, large enough, um, seems concrete. So uh, I have a word to say, I have an emotion to feel, um, then it, it feels like it's reified, but it has really begun deep inside of us at some biochemical level um, where the interactions are kind of meaningless. And um, at, at some stage of its ascent to the surface, we recognize it and we say, oh, okay, now I'm thinking this, now I'm feeling this. Um, and the problem of trying to um, get rid of thought or feeling that meditation is about emptying our head of thoughts is that um, because we're not really in control, we have to acknowledge that the thoughts were going to be there anyway. So if we did something else, if we were going to go read a book, um, our thoughts probably are guided toward um, the activity that is surrounding us to some extent, but the, the thoughts are still emergent and they're still beyond our control, ultimately. And so the idea that we can control thought or the idea that we can escape thought um, is actually just the other end of the spectrum. So when we meditate, we often think, okay, I don't want to indulge in thought. I don't want to engage and, oh, I'm feeling angry. I don't want to roll in anger and think about the person I'm angry at and then be more angry and then, you know, this cycle or sadness or whatever the the tendency of the mind is um, to roll in thoughts or roll in emotions um, and overindulge. We want to avoid that. We want to avoid indulgence. But at the same time, we want to avoid the exact opposite, and that's suppression. So the goal of meditation isn't to get rid of the thoughts or to destroy the thoughts or to empty our mind of thoughts. It's not that at all. It's between these two things. Um, and it's just to observe. And this is, of course, uh, <laughs> the difficult part. So you can't say, oh, okay, well, let me, let me absorb, let me absorb, let me observe the thoughts themselves, right? Because then you almost always get caught up in the rolling in thoughts. So if you treat thoughts themselves or emotions themselves as the meditation object, you get stuck in the rolling and the indulgence side of the equation. So you need a, a neutral meditation object. Um, and the breath uh, has all sorts of other advantageous properties. So the breath um, happens to be this bridge back and forth between the conscious and the unconscious. So that's really beneficial. Um, and it has a rhythm, um, which it is, I think, a thing that not a lot of meditation teachers necessarily address, but there is change in the breath and the change is continuous and you can observe that change. Um, so you're not narrowing in on some uh, static, unchanging entity 
um, like an image or uh, a constructed sound or something like that, um, you are observing a thing which is inherently true. So as far as, as far as we understand it, we have the breath, right? It, it is there. Um, so there's nothing to debate about the existence of the breath or the non-existence of the breath. Um, at least in the beginning, it, it is very much an apparent truth. And because it is true, um, it seems uh, entirely harmless as a meditation object, but it's also useful for crossing this bridge. And it's also useful for avoiding these extremes. So we avoid indulgence and we avoid suppression. Um, the difficult part, of course, is to simply observe the breath and then do nothing. So in doing nothing, we are trying not to suppress. We're trying not to indulge. And we're trying not to get caught up in the thoughts that the observation of breath itself will cause, and it will cause some. Um, and so it's, it's important to recognize that there are actually two aims in the use of the breath as a meditation object. One is to control the mind or to tether the mind. So the, the mind will constantly wander right? We will always be off somewhere, indulging in some fantasy, we'll be thinking about something, some problem um, that we want to solve, some idea that we have. And the control is really just to bring that back, right? And then it wanders off again, and then you bring it back, and then it wanders off again, and then you bring it back. And it's this an unbelievably boring and repetitive process of trying to get your mind to do the thing that you said, right? What did you say? You said, okay, 10 minutes, I will only follow the breath. I will only pay attention to the breath. And so of these, you know, six sense doors, um, I've chosen one and one aspect of it, and I'm only going to put my attention there. And then you realize that you have no control over your attention whatsoever. It doesn't belong to you. That's not yours. And so you have some measure of control where you can say, okay, I'm going to just keep giving this suggestion over and over again. I'm going to keep bringing my attention back to this one place where I told my attention to stay in the first place. And over time, naturally, it will begin doing that. Um, and so you have this first aspect of um, tethering the mind to some object. To just to see if you can do it almost um, it's kind of an experiment it's kind of a challenge for yourself um, but the the second quality that you get out of this is actually that you have an opportunity to observe the mind um, so you can see what kind of mind you're carrying at any given moment so again the the mind is always there the thoughts are always there the emotions are always there and so you sit down and you start meditating and you might realize that the mind you're carrying is is very different from what you thought. So perhaps you're very distracted, perhaps you're very angry, perhaps you're feeling much more anxious than you thought. Sometimes it almost feels like meditation is causing these things. It's not. It just gives you a clear window into your state of mind. Um, that state of mind would have been there regardless. Um, and you can see, oh, okay, actually my mind is doing, is doing this. This gives me a nice little sandbox for investigating what my mind state is actually like, whatever that happens to be. Um, and so, uh, I, I made an allusion to this, um, that the breath itself can be very interesting. So this is the thing is that as you start paying attention to the breath, uh, you'll start to notice subtler and subtler things, tinier and tinier things, aspects of the breath that you wouldn't have even thought to be possible, perhaps. Um, and then the breath becomes our distraction. So <laughs> previously we had 
these two ends of the spectrum where we had um, the indulgence of, of thought and emotion um, and the suppression of thought and emotion. Um, particularly emotion we don't want to deal with, we'll suppress that. Particularly uh, thoughts um, and emotions that, that we're curious about or excited about, um, a project idea we had uh, and some other uh, creativity has sprung up in our mind and we want to chase that. Um, and if you find that you can calm both of those ends for long enough and then you can focus on the breath, then all of a sudden the breath can become a bit of a distraction. So new thoughts will emerge which pertain to these small nuanced qualities of the breath. And why this is important is that you will never escape thought. So even when you are fairly narrowly focused on just the breath, you will find that even the breath can cause thoughts, even the breath can cause emotions. Um, they're subtler thoughts and subtler emotion. Um, and you might find it easier to come back to the breath from those um, than thoughts about your taxes or uh, worldwide pandemic or anything else that's troubling you at the moment. Um, but it's still a distraction from your meditation object. And the reason that you're interested in this meditation object is because you know, intellectually or otherwise, that anxiety about a pandemic, um, anxiety about your taxes, excitement for a new idea, um, whatever it is that is going on in your mind is aggregate, right? at the high level, at the top level, where you can say, this is my idea, that's, that's as gross as it gets, that's as high level as it gets. And underneath that are tiny pieces which contribute to that aggregate. And those tiny pieces are interesting. It's interesting to know where your ideas come from. It's interesting to know uh, where your fears come from, where your sadness comes from. Um, why are you afraid? why are you sad? Um, we tend to look at sadness at a, a high level and then we tend to look at some other very high level. Oh, this event made me sad. Well, no, this is just another um, incredibly gross object uh, at a very high level of mind. And so this journey into the unconscious is the purpose. This is what you're trying to do um, with this silly little game of following your breath is to learn about the unconscious and to learn to observe the unconscious. And um, this uh, is a topic for uh, another conversation, I think, because, wow, I've already been talking for 18 minutes. I knew that this one was going to be a little long. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's two topics here. One is a topic uh, that I think Preeti wants to talk about, which is this idea of free will um, and where does human behavior come from? Uh, how does it emerge in consciousness? Um, and is there anything that we actually have control over? Um, and then the other is um, a much, much broader conversation about the nature of space-time um, and the exploration of space-time and the exploration of the unconscious and um, what can you really do there within the bounds of science and physics like what can we say oh, okay this is really doable like yes I can explore um, the reason that Anapana is interesting there is that the breath takes a certain amount of time and so you can start slicing it up. You can say, oh, okay, I have a breath, but like the full cycle of a breath is an in-breath and an out-breath, right? Um, so I'll split it in half, and now I'm observing the in-breath, and now I'm observing the out-breath. Well, but the in-breath, oh, okay, so one in-breath, but I can graph that too, right? And I can split that in half, and so the first half of the in-breath, and then the second half of the in-breath, and so on and so forth. So you're just dividing time up, and by dividing it up and looking closer and looking closer, 
you can start to stretch it out and you can start to see these tiny pieces um, within the breath, within time, um, and you can start to kind of get a different handle on time um, than uh, we tend to usually have uh, in our day-to-day -day lives because time is more or less straightforward <laughs> when we're not meditating. Um, so that's a long description of um, will my thoughts ever stop? The answer is probably no. I, I think there, there's like a very... Um, it's worth be exploring the, the full context here. And there is the idea that um, Nibbana or Nirvana or um, Mukti, I don't know, whatever you want to call this thing, that all the sense doors stop, right? This idea. Um, I don't know anything about that. I can almost guarantee you don't know anything about that. So I don't really know that it's worth considering. So for all practical purposes, um, thoughts don't stop, uh, emotions don't stop. They get quieter, they get much, much, much quieter, um, but they don't cease, at least um, in my experience. So, um, the end. <laughs> okay, uh, for those people who want to meditate uh, with a video on the other side of the internet, I have a 10 minute timer for the rest of you. Um, Enjoy your guided meditation and we'll see you tomorrow. All right, 10 minutes is starting now.
think I spent the first five of those 10 minutes realizing I used the word mukti, which I'm pretty sure was my brain combining vimutti and moksha into a word that doesn't exist. <laughs> uh, I hope you all have a wonderful June 8th and good night. We'll see you tomorrow.